Do this again later. You know, he said, May this cup pass from me. Cups represent wrath. He was asking that this wrath, that he not go through it, but he said, Not my will, but yours be done. And so Jesus holds up a cup at the Seder meal, which we're going to talk about. And he says, This is the this this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. So what was his blood doing in the cup of wrath? It was fulfilling wrath. It, his blood had paid the price for the wrath that in the new covenant there's not anymore. It's covered by the blood. We'll get into that. So the second, the next miracle message. And so what we need to understand is that the reason a, a leprosy, a person had, uh, had to be a Messiah to heal someone of leprosy is they couldn't touch them. And they had to lay hands on some because as soon as you touch somebody, you were unclean. So a, a priest couldn't touch some of the leprosy. That's why they had to, uh, whenever a leper was coming close to a crowd or someone was unclean, they'd have to shout what? Unclean, unclean, so people could move out of the way. The woman with the issue of blood, she didn't say that, did she? She just snuck in there and just went, give me some of that. Okay? She had faith in it. And so... So that's another another messianic miracle was to raise someone from the dead after three days because historically there had been people raised from the dead but not after three days. Once a person's been dead for three days, considered it's considered dead. And the body starts stinking and decaying. And there's still hope up until three days. Do you ever stop and wonder why Jesus waited to go heal Lazarus? Oh, if you would have been here, you could have done it. You realize what it says? I love that story. Another good message to preach on it. He heard that Lazarus, his best friend, his buddy, his pal, friend of the family, was sick unto death. And Jesus, he kind of laughs with his disciples. He kind of laughs. <laughs> and he waited for two days. Why two days? Because that was the fourth day. He showed up on the fourth day after it was impossible to be raised from the dead. And what's he do? Messianic miracle number four. So everything Jesus did. Matter of fact, as soon as he declared that he was Messiah, Jerusalem had a group of men that were following him around to see if he was going. They were looking for the Messiah. They wanted the Messiah to show up, but no one had ever fulfilled the messianic miracles. And so there was a group of men that were always reporting back to the uh, to Jerusalem to let them know that Jesus was fulfilling these miracles. It wasn't strange. They knew that they had a problem on their hand. So we go here again, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Not only is the king he is also the lamb. Not only he's the lamb, he's the Messiah they've been waiting for who was going to come as a king. 
See, this is all building up. And it goes back even further than that. I mean, we could talk about all this. I mean, you wouldn't believe the information that's out there if we just open up our minds and hearts and willing to go outside of our little boxes that we're told in the groups of people we meet with. But Bethlehem, see, we're still talking about the lamb. How did that lamb get, to show you how, how uh, far off our minds are from really what happened in Israel at any time. Bethlehem was known as the house of bread. That was the, that's what it means, the house of bread. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Jesus was born where? Well, sort of, kind of. We're and I'm not saying this to destroy your Christmas. I, I, I'm not saying this to, to mess up your traditions. If you want to think, if you think there was three wise men and uh, they showed up when Jesus was born, Silent at night. You know, if you want to believe all that, go right ahead. But the, I'm going to tell you the traditions of men make the word of God of what? No, no effect. So we're going to mess with your Christmas right now and go back to Bethlehem. The city of what? David. The city of David. He was the son of David. Here's something real interesting. Joy, put, uh, put Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. Does anybody know the day Jesus was crucified on in, in Jewish calendar years? Nisan 14. He was crucified on the 14th of Nisan. No question about it. Whether you think it's a Wednesday or a Friday, that's up to you. I'm not going to argue all that. But he was crucified on Nisan 14. Oh, Bible nerd alert. So all the generations, if you read all the generations, you can do that on your own time. So all the generations from Abraham to David are what? 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are what? 14. You can read that in, on your own. And, and uh, our 14 generations, and from the, the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are what? 14 generations. And if you take, the, we, we don't, please don't let us scare you in this, okay? But, but if you take the name David, and Jewish, no, Jewish letters have numbers that are attached to them. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Uh, if you just, you can do this on your own, look it up, whatever. The, if you spell out the word and they do right to left, if, if you spell out the, the name David, there's three letters that spell the word David. And there's two letters that are the same number. There's a four, a six, and a four. What does that add up to? 14. 14. Just a Bible nerd coincidental thing. Just so I see God is so precise in what he does. See, you read Matthew 1, 17, you go, what's the big deal about number 14? Well, it's to identify with David, who was four, not 14 years old, but his name of value was 14. 14, 14, 14. Here's Christ, and he was crucified on Nisan what? 14. This is just fun stuff. And so we get now to Jesus' birth, and we think Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which it says he was born in Bethlehem, but not quite. This goes all the way back to Genesis. I mean, by the way, we're, we're on our way all the way back to the, the garden on this, okay? We're, put Genesis 35, I think it is. Do you know, remember what it is? Genesis 3? No, 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 no. Not that yet. Does everybody know the story of Rachel? Yep. Yes, 35, 24. 35, 21. That was close. I just said 35. Then Israel journeyed from, uh, journeyed and pitched to his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. All right. The Tower of Eater, uh, for, for, for your sake here, uh, let's go ahead and put, uh, I don't know if we should read them or just tell you. Uh, put Micah 4.8. We'll read these and then go back and tell you what they mean. Micah 4.8 says what? 
Oh, you tower of the flock. But by the word, uh, Migdal Eater is a Jewish two words put together. It means the tower of the. If you look this up, it actually says, Oh, you, uh, and you, oh, Migdal Eater. All right. So in, and in Genesis 35 21, go back to Genesis. Oh, let me read the stronghold of Zion, uh, the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. Even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. So we need to understand there's a, go to 5.8 or 5.2. Go 5.2, Micah 5.2 in my Bible, it's the next page. But you, O Bethlehem, so, yeah, someone say that for me. <laughs> Though you are little among thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler over this is a prophetic word that, that the Messiah was going to come out of Bethlehem, which recognitions of a place called the Tower of Eder. And in Genesis chapter 35, 21, you have a situation going on here. Turn with me to the book of Luke. We'll put all this together. Luke chapter 2. We'll give you the real Christmas story here. Does anybody remember a lady named Rachel? Rachel died, died in childbirth. She was on her way to Bethlehem when she gave birth to her last son, of course, and died. And there's actually a tomb there called Rachel's yeah. Tomb. Okay? It's there right where it's always been. To the, and it even says it's going to be there. But she died in Rachel's. Uh, she gave birth and then died after she gave birth. But where did she give birth at? What we need to understand, we go, we could go back into Chronicles and show you how this is done, but but these towers, these these uh, Migdal Edders, the tower of the flocks, these are where they would uh, have a well and a birthing center for the lambs. Uh, this is actually a picture. Of, of course, it was much nicer back in the day, and this was a, a tower that would overlook the. The grazing lands was also used for defenses and things like this to see when an enemy was coming. But the Migdal Eater in Bethlehem was a special Migdal Eater in Bethlehem. Now, this is where it's going to hopefully change your, your Christmas. Uh, Luke chapter 2. Verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first look pla took place while Herodias. yeah, was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own what? His own city. And Joseph also went up to Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of what? Because he belonged there, which, he is, uh, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the, say, lineage. In this culture, if you were part of the family, you owned what the family owned. Do you understand that? It wasn't like just showing up in Parker's Prairie hoping to get a room at the Prairie Inn, you know what I'm saying? It's like to be registered with Mary, his what? Say the word betrothed. You need to under, keep, you're going to keep things in context right now. So she was pregnant, but she was betrothed. She wasn't married, but she was married, but she wasn't consummated. It was like she had not to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while, I'm just going to read this. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Now, I don't do it. I've seen it. My daughter's pregnant. I've never been pregnant. But I've seen them walk like, oh. <laughs> we see Mary getting off the donkey or staying on the, uh, getting late at night, knocking on all the doors. Hey, any, play, any room in the inn? Oh, the, like, like the day they get there, she's going to pop and give birth. The days, they were there for days before. They were there days before. And when it says there was no room for her in the inn, that word is Cataluma. 
There are two ends mentioned in scripture. One is here, and it's called a cataluma. And there's one in Luke chapter 10 where Jesus takes, oh, I gave that up, excuse me. Well, the good Samaritan takes the person that was uh, on the in the gutter, left in the ditch, takes him to an innkeeper and leaves him at the inn. That's a different word than cataluma. Panda hi yoin. You say that one. Panda hi yoin. That's... <laughs> so what you need to understand is that the word cataluma means guest chamber. It means, see, the other one was for strangers. It's like a motel. The cataluma is for someone of your family. It's like a mother-in-law apartment. They had every right to stay in any Cataluma in town because they were of the lineage of David. But when it says that there was no room, doesn't mean that they were all booked up people. It means that Joseph and Mary had been shunned and they couldn't take them in. What happens if you're Amish and you do something Amish don't like? Got the picture? You're what? You're shunned. In the Jewish culture, if you're unclean, you'd make the whole family unclean. What happens when a woman's on her menstrual cycle? How many days go by that she unclean? Seven. When she gives birth, she's unclean for what? She seven days. You can't if she couldn't give birth in the cataluma, the guest chamber, she would make the whole house unclean. So she had to go someplace, and this is where you have a problem in most Bibles. But look it up in, it's not hard to find this out. You don't have to take my word for it. Let me just read to his verse 7, verse 6. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in, say, the manger. It's not a manger it's the manger because there was no room for her uh, there were no room for them in the cataluma now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night and behold an angel of the lord stood around about them and the glory of the lord shone around about them and they were greatly afraid how many people have heard this story before have you ever heard it preached? God brought Jesus to the lowliest of the low out in the, there was just poor shepherd. What we don't know keeps us in bondage. There was something called Levitical shepherds. Bethlehem was the, outside of Bethlehem was the ranch. Say, I'm from Texas, if you can't tell. We call it a ranch. There was a ranch that was known for, it was the only place they raised Passover sacrificial lambs. And there was a place there called a Migdal Eater where all the Passover lambs and lambs were going to be sacrificed in the future, they were all birthed there. Every you, Rachel's name means what? You, she was an E-W-E. She gave birth to the lamb. She died at the Migdal Eater. And she was buried in Rachel's tomb outside the Migdal Eater. Get the picture? This is where it's happened before in history. Now, to show you how far off we are, Jewish culture in context. Okay, these were Levitical shepherds. They had to prove. They were the best of the best of the best shepherds. They had to qualify to be a Levitical shepherd. They had to take care of the big doll eater. The bottom floor of the big doll eater was a place for birthing of the lambs. And there was a place called the stall or a manger. And the room was full. Guess what? Because there was birthing going on, it was a place of what? Uncleanness. Mary had to go someplace that was unclean while she was unclean to give birth, but it was full of swaddling cloth. I think everybody just carried a bunch of swaddling cloth with them. They were, I don't know, I might need some swaddling cloths one day. No, she went to a place that was known. God took them to a place that was known 
that this is where the Passover lamb was going to come from. That's how, I don't know if you're getting a picture of this. We look back on it now and go, oh, this is amazing. Type and shadow of good things to come. The very place that Jesus was born was in the place, the same place that the sacrificial lambs were born. To show you how far off we are in our imagination, how many days in a Jewish calendar? Yep, 360. 360. According to the book of Leviticus, they had to sacrifice two lambs per day. How many is that? That's 720 lambs a year just for the daily sacrifice, one in the morning and one in the evening, every day. How many people lived in Jerusalem and in the area? That each family had to have a lamb for sacrifice. So all the lambs, we're talking about tens of thousands of lambs are no older than a year. How big is this ranch? King Ranch. <laughs> yeah, King Ranch. <laughs> Literally. Did you ever imagine that many lambs being slaughtered at Passover, or not just Passover, but in sacrifices for a yearly basis? Tens of thousands. Well, yeah, we're, we're thinking one or two little shepherds. No, there were, who knows how many shepherds, uh, and that's just of the pure, the, the perfect ones. How many weren't perfect? <sighs> and then those same, not small amount of shepherds running around all over town in Bethlehem saying, oh my gosh, the Messiah's born. So let's finish the story. Verse 9, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A what? A Savior, a Messiah. And this will be a sign. You'll, what's the sign? You'll find the babe wrapped in. Where's the one place they can go to find swaddling cloth? And lying in the manger. There's only one the manger where there's swaddling cloth. They knew. I, see, this is the picture we get. Uh, excuse me, we're just lowly shepherds and this people say, well, they just followed the star. The star didn't show up until the wise men came. They didn't come at the same time. That was a year and a half later. The star didn't point the way for the shepherds. So I can, uh, excuse me, do you got a manger in the back? Is there something happening there? No? Okay. Next house. You got anything happen back there? They didn't, they knew exactly where to go. They went to the Migdal Eater, the same place that Rachel gave birth. Her tomb is right outside the Migdal Eater. So when you go to Bethlehem and see the birthplace of Jesus, don't get off the bus. <laughs> don't get off the bus. And see, this goes back even further. And we could talk about this, but we're getting hungry. Don't worry, we're almost no, done. You need, to, you need to do all this. What? You need to do all this. Well, I'm going on. I'm going on. And see, it, all, it doesn't just start there. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We're setting you up now. If you plan on leaving after dinner, don't. This is all a setup for what's coming. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Anybody know what happens there? And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and 
her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his. Uh, I'm going to take a little side note. I'm known as taking rabbi trails instead of rabbit trails. <laughs> Who's the seed of the woman? Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus. If the woman has seed, and the, that means the serpent has Wait a minute, let me read this way. And the offspring of the woman is going to crush the head of the offspring of the serpent. Do you ever think about that? Did Mary have offspring? His name is Jesus. Who's the offspring of the serpent? Jesus said it this way. You brood of... Another, another verse he says, you of your father, the, the religious system. Jesus came to crush the head of self-righteousness. Ooh, someone needed to hear that. That hurt somebody in this room. I could feel it. Genesis chapter 3 is a prophetic word that there was going to be a Messiah come that God had a plan for a Messiah to come. Can we go back further than that? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, word. Can't go back much farther. One. <laughs> well. This is called the bearer sheet. Just go ahead and talk. Put it up there real quick. Uh, put it Isaiah 46.10. You need to see this real quick. This is Isaiah 46, uh, it's not 46.10, but she'll get there. Declaring the end from the, see, God in the, in, to, to, God took a prophet named Isaiah and spoke this aloud, and I believe it is what it says it is. God, through Isaiah, he says, the, go, go up to nine. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the yeah. crowd participation day. Declaring the what? Yeah. From the beginning. Is this saying in Isaiah 46.10 that in the beginning he declared the end? Yes. That's what it's saying. I'm not making this up. Declaring the end from the so does that mean we can go back to the beginning and find the end? Yes! Wait, let's just look at the word in the beginning. Is that the first place beginning is mentioned? That's the first place beginning is mentioned. And what did God tell Isaiah to tell us? That he declared the end from the very word, what? Beginning. This is how you spell the word beginning. Now, I don't mean to confuse the issue. I know most of you are Hebrew scholars. And this doesn't look like Hebrew to you, does it? Got a question. Well, a comment. Hebrew is the only language that when it's spoken or written, it can be communicated three different ways with one, one effort. In other words, it's, 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 it's uh, phonetical, it's mathematical or numerical, and it's a picture graph. Where did, the, where did Jews learn how to write? They didn't know how to write before. They, they were just a family. When they went into e Egypt, they became the slaves, and when they came out, they were a they were a nation. But where did they learn to write? How did Egyptians write? Hieroglyphics, right? So it would make sense that they learned how to write via hieroglyphics, and when they went to Babylon, that's when they started having block letters and different. And you can see it in their history how their letters morphed from being pictures. This is the this is the the second letter in the Jewish alphabet. We don't have time to do this tonight today, but if you look at Psalms 119 in your Bibles, and you can see it's listed in there. It's the Aleph Bet. It goes down and lists it throughout the whole chapter, all the Jewish alphabet, and it tells you the this and what number. Uh, and you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, so forth. But this is what it would, would it looked like in. Paleo Hebrew writings. This is what is known as ancient Hebrew. I can read this better than I can read regular Hebrew because I'm dyslexic. I like pictures. 
Pictures mean more to me than words do, okay? So anyway, so this right here is the, the floor plan of a, you're looking down at a house. See, that's the entry. That's a, a simple house. It's not yours. These are simple. Oh, by the way, I didn't, I didn't, sh I, I, I should have shared that earlier. Notice there's no door. It's just an opening. See, in Egypt, the slaves didn't have doors. They had door ways. No. Say doorways. doorways. That's a doorway, right? And the blood was shed on the doorway. the the door doors, uh, the door post, and the lintel, which created a doorway. See, they did, in Jewish culture, where do they sprinkle the blood? On the altar. So where was the first altar in the book of Exodus? The doorway. Maybe that's why Jesus says, I am the... It's only through me. Oh, anyway. I like it. So th this is... Th this actually... And, and the word for the, the, the descriptive words, this is a, a floor plan of a house, but it's actually the, the literal word, if you were to write in, like in the beginning, in English we have the word in, well, this is the, the, the word and the letter for in. So this is in beginning. They don't have a word for the. So it's in beginning. So this is the first phrase in the first book, in the first chapter, the first phrase in God's word to us. And Isaiah said he's declared the end from the beginning. They read right to left. So you have in, and then you have this figurehead here with like a crown or something of authority on his head and that's the the we're, don't worry Brad we're not going to go do the whole thing okay uh, this is resh all right so this is bet resh this is symbolizing of a prince or first uh son you might say and why do we say son and remember this is the word for in like something is in here our dwelling our indwelling the indwelling the it's what that represents and so this is resh, meaning son or prince. And so, but when you put these two words together, it literally spells the word bar, B-A-R in Hebrew, in modern day Hebrew. Ever heard of a bar mitzvah? Bar mitzvah is spelled bet resh, and then mitzvah. Got it? So, but that means son. So the word son is just confirming that someone who's in this house. The question is, who's in this house? Well, obviously it's the son that's in this house. The son of who? Or whose son is he? Well, this is the Aleph. This is supposed to be an ox head with horns. And, and Aleph, that's the first letter of the alphabet. It's also the first letter in Elohim. This is, uh, this actually means, I'll, I'll do this real quick. When you put these three together, it means uh, bera. It means created. It's the in beginning God Elohim created. The word bera. Can't get into that. That's deep too. But this is actually saying in this house is the son. Is in this house the son of who? The creator, the God. So whose son? Who who are we talking about? Say Jesus real quick. Jesus. Okay. I was just speeding that up. Okay. <laughs> In case you didn't get it, Jesus is in heaven. God's son is in heaven in this dwelling. This is teeth. See the little, hey. sometimes they look like beaver teeth, depending on who, who chisels them into concrete. Well, stone. Okay. And it's the sheen. And what we understand about the sheen, everybody do this. Everybody do that. Okay. Can you do that? Any Star Trek fans we got in here? You need to smell for them. Just tape them together. Yeah, live long and prosper. Leonard Nimoy, Leonard Nimoy was a Jew. You knew that, right? He was a Jew, and he got casted in this. He's going to play an alien in this movie series, and they asked him to come up with a greeting because every alien has to have a how. A special greeting. Indians go how. You know, every culture has to have some kind of greeting, and it's a messianic greeting. Leonard Nimoy, the only thing he could think of was when he was a, a child, he saw the elders in his community blessing each other, saying, and it, there's a whole blessing that they would do, 
But well, basically, song. basically it goes like this: live long and prosper. That's all the blessing song out of Deuteronomy. So he said, "Well, I'm gonna do that in the movie." So every time he does this in any show, how many people are going around going, "Live long and prosper," and they don't know it? Speaking God's word on people. That's what, and, and it's actually the the stamp. It's like if God had a bunch of cattle on a thousand hills. And he had a, a a brand to show ownership. He had, you'd have that. It's also the letter. When you see the letter, it you, you look down at Jerusalem. That's the the geographical shape of Jerusalem. Of the there's three valleys and two hills. So from heaven, it looks like God put his. And you can read two you places in Chronicles. Kind of, you can kind of see it a little bit here. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. See. See. Here's one. Here's one. And there's one. You got it? This is Gehenna. This is the Kidron Valley. And this is the Sinner Valley. And so you have this, wow. From God put his name, this, where Jerusalem is sitting. Now, we don't have time to go. Get off that. Get back. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Brisket is waiting. So anyway, so you have this sheen. And and we, we got to go. We just go. And, and, and this is called a yod. It's a little mark like this right now. But it's a number 10, and it's a yod. It's a hand and an elbow. See the, see that? It means divine work or deed or, or, or something that God's planned on. It's a, it's a divine plan. It's an ordinal plan that's perfect. Okay, now wait a minute. You have in, who's in? Son, son of who? Creator. But what's really interesting is when you take this letter, this letter and this letter, it spell it spells the word resh. Okay, just just bear with me. That means even though this says son, this spells the word. Excuse me, this spells the word resh. Without this, is it saying that the son that was in here is no longer in here, but now he's over here? That's exactly what it's saying. Now wait a minute. The son has come out because of this, has come out of what he was in. He has left heaven because of the divine plan that the father has had that was going to happen at a place called Tav. The last letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the Tav. The Tav. Wait a minute. It's a cross. And that's that. This is pretty much the exact. There's it actually looks like a stick, two cross, two sticks crossed, like this right here. Now wait a minute. So the son is left where he was at, because the father has a plan of a divine nature that is going to be established one day. Do you realize the cross was not used? The Romans invented the cross. So the first word in the first chapter, in the first book, at the very beginning, this is telling us that the most important time in history, not creation, according to God's perspective, creation is not the biggest event. The biggest event that was going to take place on this planet was going to happen here. The cross is a sign of something coming to an end. And something beginning. Man. And so, wait a minute. This happened right before. And Brad, you made a mistake. No. Yes. Yeah, I'm keeping record, though. Let, let me read you the scripture here. Yep. How did you know I was going there? Hebrews chapter 4. We're not going to read all this. We're going to start with verse 3. Because you, you didn't think we'd go any further back than Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, word 1, right? I didn't think so. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. To show you how far back this goes. For he, for we who have believed do enter that rest 
as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished, say it out loud, before the foundations of the world. Before Genesis 1-1, God had already planned and finished what Jesus was going to do at Calvary to undo what man did in the garden. See, man messed up in the garden. Turned, his, turned the authority that he had unto, to, uh, unto Satan. And Satan ruled this world, and the only person that could take it back was someone that looked just like him. Do you realize that Adam and Jesus looked alike? I know it doesn't mean a big deal to you, but family members usually look alike, don't they? How can I say Jesus and Adam looked alike? And what does it really matter? If you're a Bible nerd, you'll love it. Adam was created in the image and the... And Jesus was the expressed... Okay. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. I'm going to say it real nicely. We don't have time to get into it. But six different places by four different authors all mention things that have happened before the foundations of the world. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Put it on the board since we're getting close to eating time. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, this remember, this is just set up. Don't forget you need the, the time for the Seder meal. Just <laughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him. Say it out loud. Before the foundations of the world, when were you chosen to be holy, blameless, and in his love? Before the foundations of the world. Put 1 Timothy 1 9. How many people saved? Raise your hands. Yeah. <laughs> Who has saved us and called us what? A holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time. You're not here for you. God chose us here to be here for him, not to go to heaven so we can bring heaven to hell on earth. There's a reason you're going to Japan. But there's also hell here on earth in America. It's not about getting people to say a magic prayer to go to a place they've never been before for all eternity. It's about living in a way that's going to bring God glory on earth. So we've gone all the way from the triumphal entry all the way back from before time began to see that God had a plan and resurrection, Calvary, and the Passover and the, and the Palm Sunday is all a fulfillment of what God planned from the very beginning for a Messiah to come forth as king and high priest and deliverer. Wow. So now we jump back into the Palm Sunday, Jesus entering the eastern gate. You have all the priests going, tell your disciples. Now you know why they tell them. Pilate's coming in this way. They're saying, blessed is the king. They understand history. They're going all the way back. Hey, someone's going to crush the head. Yay, this is the man. He's proven it. They come in and they prepare. We're just going to jump, jump real quick. They go to the Seder meal. Does anybody been participate in a Seder meal before? Seder meal has how many steps? Say 15. 15 steps in the Seder mill. In the middle of the Seder mill, there's something called the matzah tosh. A matzah tosh is a, a, an envelope with three compartments in it. And each of the envelopes, the three envelopes, has a piece of matzah in it. The matzah is like a giant saltine cracker. Okay, can I just say it that way? It's, it's bland. There's no yeast in it. It's pierced. There's holes in it. Uh, it's cooked on a grill, so it's striped. And Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for do this. Now see, when, you get, when we get done here tonight, the next time someone says, do this remembrance of him, whew, because Jesus was telling his disciples, do this in remembrance of me and what he's done and what he's about ready to go through. 
We forget that part. And so they knew what this matzotash was. This is the third time Jesus had a Seder meal with his disciples. And he opened up the Seder, the, the matzotash. He pulls out the middle matzah, which is reserved. That, it, it, it's, that is the, the, the matzah of the Messiah. Jesus pulls out the middle matzah and says, this is me. He says, I am the Messiah. He says, this is my body. Which is, and we, we look at it this way, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What he reached in and pulled out the what? The Son. Man. And so the, the Seder meal, there's 15 steps we're going to go through. But everything he did was to show everybody that he's the Messiah. Even in the rituals. At the end of the supper, he took up the cup. He said, this is the cup of the? New covenant. What's cup represent? Wrath. What was this cup filled with? Matter of fact, no one had ever drunk from this cup before. It was filled with blood, but what was the cup represent? New covenant, but it was the cup, cups represent wrath. So the wrath that was in the old covenant was filled by the blood. There was no more wrath in the new covenant. Man. We need to understand how powerful all this is. And I, I know it's a lot of information, but we're going to stop and break. All this was done to set up this next half. And there's going to be music. There's going to be cheering and celebration. I hope you're not so full that you can't get out of your chair and shout Jesus because everybody else is.